All the good people are here. All, All the, the best yeah. people are here. All the important folks. Yeah, yeah. The winners. The yeah. winners of the conference are here. <laughs> so, um, so you guys uh, may not know this, but I think we're the only two for one special here at the conference. So you get both myself and Tom, and uh, I'm actually going to let uh, Tom introduce himself first. So do that, Tom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, Tom Fenwick is my name. I work for CloudBees, um, and I've done for the last two years, so since 2013. Um, I came into CloudBees on the platform as a service side of the house. So I guess my background is more so in middleware and the back end than UI development. Um, but that's where we are now. So, so uh, uh, my name is, is Gus. As you can see from the slide there, that's a reasonable likeness of me, I think. Um, uh, I have been doing uh, UI and UX work for about 20 years now. Um, mostly for smaller companies, um, some larger companies, most notable is probably uh, Adobe slash Macromedia when I was there. Um, uh, but uh, um, I came here with a degree um, from a liberal arts college where I studied art and philosophy, so that really makes me qualified to be the sensitive member of our team here. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the gist of how Tom and I break up. Um, uh, we've got a little agenda that we want to go through. Um, uh, and We've got no video. Okay, well, I, I can go through the agenda anyway. Um, so we have a, a sort of brief history of the Jenkins GUI um, uh, that I'm going to show just to give a little context for um, how things have evolved and uh, uh, what we're going to try to do. Um, then Tom is going to show you in some detail um, some of the early stuff that we've done in the last couple of months um, and some of the groundwork that that's going to lay for the following demo that I'm going to show you which is going to show you a little bit of future stuff for how, uh, how Jenkins might look and work um, in the next couple of releases. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go with the light show. So uh, um, let's make sure I got my bullet points right. So brief history of the Jenkins GUI, recent GUI evolution, yep, yep, fruitful steps forward, yep, yep, proof of concept and feedback. Um, and the big takeaway, yeah. So um, the big takeaway that I really want to make sure uh, everybody gets from this, um, and I'm pretty sure that you will, is that certainly Tom and I take uh, the Jenkins UI super seriously, as does CloudBees. And as this room is filling up, I'm starting to believe that the Jenkins community also realizes that to some extent, the growth of Jenkins in the future is going to need, going to be dependent to some degree on addressing what I think is fair to say is a weakness of Jenkins at the moment, which is that the UI is a, maybe a little bit long in the tooth, a little bit dated. Okay, so uh, uh, let's move into that, that brief history of Jenkins. So uh, um, like any good timeline, this timeline starts really with uh, the beginning of recorded time, uh, 40,000 BCE, you had your first cave paintings. And uh, um, even then, Primitive Man knew that software had bugs in it. So shortly thereafter, KK invented Hudson. <laughs> So, uh, so there it is, Hudson. Um, that's what it looked like. When it came into existence, it was green, as you saw from his keynote. But by and large, it looks fairly familiar. Then uh, uh, in 2011, we have the great Jenkins-Hudson schism. Um, at that point, the UI went, underwent some fairly major undertakings where the Jenkins-Butler changed. So you can see that. Um, and then now we have, so far, a similar degree of change. You know, it's not super obvious. But under the covers here, uh, Tom and I are setting a bit of groundwork that, again, is going to lead to the demo I'm going to show uh, here at the end. So uh, I'm going to let Tom dive in a bit into the specifics of what we're doing right this second. Thanks, Gus. So yeah, so basically over the last year or so, we've been, um, people probably recognize that UI has changed a small bit. So uh, mostly around the look and feel of Jenkins. And we've done some other stuff as well, like add responsive layout so basically that means changing the table based layouts with div based layouts so making Jenkins look a bit better a little bit better on different types of devices and stuff like that and I've also listed the fact here that we um, we replaced the like image based icons with CSS based icons now we did other things as well but the reason I wanted to, to, to put that up here um, will become apparent later when I do a bit of, de a, bit of a demo and um, but I guess one of the important things to us that was that whatever changes we made, we uh, uh, initially anyway, because we were new, both of us were new to the community at the time as well, uh, we didn't want to go breaking any plugins and uh, creating a bad reputation for ourselves and stuff like that. So, um, so they were the things. But the, I think the, the most important thing, especially in terms of this talk, um, 
would be the things that we learned during that process. Um, and basically, we've kind of listed, we've listed three things here that we uh, we want to talk about today. These are three things that we think if um, if we address within Jenkins, within Jenkins Core, um, there are things that uh, improvements that we think can make the, the lead to the Jenkins UI better user experience and stuff like that within the Jenkins UI. So the first thing, and this is something I'm going to talk about in more detail in a minute, is fixing the problem of CSS modularization. So at the moment. If you're familiar with Jenkins Core, you'll know there is no real modularization of CSS, and it's just a big one big file with everything bundled in there, and um, you can't really do a whole file with it other than get into the code and change it. Um, another thing, another well-known problem um, is, the, is, is the fact that the page structures within Jenkins are uh, a bit problematic. Um, basically, there's no semantic layout. There's no real way of actually interpreting the, in, interpreting the layout of the page at the moment. And the biggest um, kind of uh, most well-known side effect of that would be the Jenkins configuration page, which, as most people know, can become very uh, difficult to use if you've got lots of plugins and stuff like that and so on. That's something that Gus is going to talk about in a lot of detail. He, that and a lot more. He's got a really cool demo that he's going to show you. Um, and then lastly, uh, if we've time at the end, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, JavaScript modularization within Jenkins, which similar to the CSS stuff, is uh, kind of non-existent. Everything is fired into one or two JavaScript files in, in core, and it's a bit of a maintenance nightmare, and you can't find anything in there. Uh, so as we said, if, we feel if we can address three, these three problems in particular, and maybe some other problems, uh, that in itself could uh, lead to a, a new dawn within Jenkins UI development, and it allows us to do some other really cool stuff. So, um, the first of those three things, something I'm going to talk about, I guess, and uh, that is the the, C the problem of the CSS, and in particular around the fact that the modularization is a bit of a problem at the moment. So one of the things we've been experimenting with using um, in a number of enterprise plugins in Jenkins, and also actually within some of the stuff I'm going to show you here, is a thing called Less, which is a CSS preprocessor, and. Um, so less allows us, one of the things that allows us to do, of course, is solve this modularization issue. It allows us to break all of the stuff that's in style.css within Jenkins core and put it into kind of partition it into more meaningful um, modules, uh, CSS modules. So that's the first thing less allows us to do. But it allows us to do a number of other things as well, which uh, we think can, can help us do lead to other really cool stuff within the UI. And um, the other, one of the other things is parameterization. So if you look in, in the CSS and Jenkins at the moment today, you'll see that there's colors and things like border widths and border styles and all sorts of stuff littered throughout the, the style. But, and and the, so there's no consistency in, in terms of the colors and, the, and, and these other uh, stylistic things. So what CLESS will allow us to do is actually parameterize some of those things and kind of define them as variables at the top and then reuse the variables. So if you, if you want to change a color, you don't have to, you don't, you don't miss it and you don't have to miss it in one place or something like that. And then the third primary benefit as we see it for Jenkins with using less or, or something like less um, would be the fact that it allows us to actually uh, more easily kind of namespace the CSS that we use within Jenkins. And the reason why that's important then is it allows us to actually use um, lots of common kind of CSS libraries like Bootstrap, most people are probably familiar with that, and then there's J jQuery UI and there's kind of grid libraries and stuff like that. But using those today at the moment uh, without something like less and without namespacing them it would, 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 could lead to all sorts of problems because you'd have clashes with, with, um, with the actual um, CSS rules and stuff like that. So there are kind of three things just from a, sorry, just from um, like kind of a maintenance and um, standpoint within, within CSS and within Jenkins that, that um, less solves. But it also then, it, it, having solved these problems, it, uh, it basically allows us to start adding other features to Jenkins. And one of the things that we've been playing around with is this idea of UI teams. And basically, because you've, come, you've modularized the CSS and parameterized it, now you can actually do things, you can do kind of cool things just from the CSS standpoint alone. Um, so that allow, basically will allow users to kind of uh, affect the style and configure the style and behavior of the UI in, in an easier to do way and to do it on a per user basis. So like basically for, for each user, each user can log in and, uh, to their account and can 
change the UI a little bit and have diff things like different status balls or manipulate the header of the page, manipulate, manipulate how the, 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 the menu on the left behaves, how the history widget and that looks and feels, like little things. Basically like re-skinning of your UI and the habit for your account so you're not, so you're not using a, a, an interface that you maybe don't like that someone else has imposed. Um, so as well as that, like it's not just eye candy as well. It's not just making the thing look good. Um, this has obviously a huge benefit for people like with, with like usability issues like visual impairments, colour blindness and stuff like that. Okay, so with that I'm going to give a little bit of a demo. So we've done we've done a bit of this already played around with UA team, so let's take a little bit of that here. So I've got two browsers set up here. So basically I've got a Jenkins running in the background here with this UI theme stuff running on it. Now I'm not going to go into the detail of the architecture of how it works, but the basic idea, what, what I've done is um, started the process of modularizing the CSS within Jenkins. And I've broken out uh, four, four or five different, different themes. Um, and out of the core CSS, I've basically created what we call a classic implementation of each of those themes. And then I've created other implementations uh, on top, uh, like alternative implementations that users can configure. Um, so if you, if you look at the, the, the two browsers, we don't have a login on either of these. So I'm going to log in to different users on uh, each browser. So when I log in, by default, each user just has Jenkins as it stands today. You don't see any difference yet. So in order to go log this in, so what you do basically here is I'm going to go into my account. And when I log in here, I get these UI themes with an ugly icon at the moment. So it goes a little job there for us to create a nice icon for that. But when I, when I go into the UI themes, I can see the, the different themes that I've created here. Page, a theme for page header, icons, status balls, and console output. And this is all stuff that's actually in style at CSS today. And what I did was basically broke it out, created a theme, created a classic implementation of each of those. So if you see at the top here, so what you've got in the tabs at the top are the actual themes. What you've got on the left hand side are implementation of those themes that the user can, config, can select and configure in some cases where they're parameterized. So back to less parameterization again. So if you look at the classic page header theme, I basically I, I introduced three different parameters on those. So you can change like the, the top color, the, the, head, the head color. Um, you can put in a different uh, icon in the background there. Um, so if you want to put your company icon or whatever, you can change the font color, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to change my Header, and you can create these different um, implementations as well. So I created a light implementation that just basically styles some of the, the header stuff uh, in a particular way that's kind of pre-canned and you can use it. And then on the icon side, I introduced it, created a font, I took the font awesome icon set, people may or may not be familiar with that, I think it's from Twitter, um, and I created a team implementation of the icons from that. Uh, then the status ball, so like on the build screens, the little orbs that spin around and stuff like that. The classic, the, the ones that we know that come with Jenkins by default and are in the classic set. And then you can create, basically I created a set of CSS based, and a CSS tree animated set of um, status balls that you can select. And then the console output there. So I'm just going to select that and leave that as is. So if I refresh the page, obviously, refresh it. So I always forget to ask this up front, but I, I sort of always want to know, um, in the room here, what percentage of you all uh, have created plugins and, and are interested in creating plugins in the future? And I, I'm assuming uh, everybody here uses some number of plugins? Yeah? <laughs> so, um, so there's an extent to which, cool, like you can theme stuff, you can put a new image in there, that's, that's great. But there's a, a part of this that, that really, very selfishly for me, um, when I saw this, uh, got really excited about, um, and that is uh, the fact that Tom has not only done this but then built a UI for it. Is he's put a, a really strong exclamation point on the level of abstraction that he's made between the way the GUI works and the way the GUI looks. Um, and to date, um, if you go and you just view source on Jenkins and you know anything about HTML and CSS. Prior to this, if you'd have gone and looked through it, you'd find little style declarations sort of in line, and those are completely hard coded, just jammed in there, which completely removes the possibility of abstracting the look away from the actual functionality, which ends up putting a giant, giant break on uh, um, on trying to do any sort of major theming. And in addition to that, as, as you probably also know, 
Um, in matters of opinion, there's no dispute, right? Everybody's correct. Everybody's right about their own opinion. Um, so in a, in a community like this, where we want to basically be driven by you guys, and you guys may have your own, own opinions, the other thing that's really fantastic for me is that we immediately have a mechanism that when you look at the stuff that I do and you go, <laughs> you're going to be you're going to be able to pull it out. Right? You're going to be able to essentially tune it for yourself, and that's going to provide air cover for more significant UI changes that are, um, are also going to have some function. So anyway, um, yeah, so I modified my account there, just tweaked a few of the teams on it, and as you can see, when I go out to Gus's account here, reload his, it's, ha it's had no effect on his. He can st he still sees the UI as he wants it. So just to finish off, uh, I'm going to go into Gus here, leave his alone. I'm going to select the font awesome icons on his, on his account. So as you can see, the minute I select them, you can see the icons on the left here have changed, and this goes back to this, the original slide. The reason why they've changed is down to like a little small, a small and kind of seemingly kind of irrelevant change that we made during that during that last year. That was to change the images to use CSS. And the reason why this, we're able to do this, uh, change these fonts now or change these icons now is the, is based on that. That instead of having these image things, image uh, tags inside and the hard coded inside and the HTML. We just put in a, uh, a span, give it a class, and now we can basically apply any style we want. That goes back to exactly what just what Gus just said there about abstracting the actual um, style and, uh, the, the, from the actual content that's being displayed. Okay. So then Gus, I'm going to give Gus CSS tree as well, but his eyes are a bit wonky, so we'll give him say that success color is blue. No offense to anyone with bad eyes or issues issue with their eyes. Um, and there is darken the red a little bit. So now, uh, and we'll say the console. So this is the like console output. I created a simple thing that just changes the the background in the console. So that's goes to change there now. So um, refresh again. You can see it a little bit different. Let's kick off this. I build a this guy here. Nearly, nearly finished. So refresh this. So this is all done using CSS3. These, these aren't images, and we basically like we use less to manipulate the colors to, to um, put in transparency and the colors and stuff like that. And sorry, that's that's a bit different. And then use those. We had the oh, sorry, yeah. So as you can see, the console is a little bit different on his compared to on mine. But that's the general gist of it. And what is on the There's nothing radical there as such, but still it means that we can manipulate the UI a little bit, and that's purely just down to modularizing the CSS and, and parameterizing. Now we have a way to switch in different flavors of those teams for, for, for different people. Different people can do it on a per account basis. So that's the end of that part there. And let us get going on his um, Want to keep going for Okay. So, um, so in, in in my view of, of UI land, um, there's sort of a, a three different sort of distinct levels of, of UI change that you might make. Uh, the first, and in some sense, the most trivial, is just sort of packaging and decoration. Right. You, you can make it prettier. You can make the buttons better colors. You can line them up. Um, but there's no real functional change there. And the second level is you, you change the UI in such a way that it's actually easier and nicer to work with. You can't actually do anything new, but uh, um, uh, it's like the difference between a Windows CE phone and your first iPhone, right? You, you can basically do all the same things, just one of them kind of sucks. Um, uh, so that's sort of level two of UI. And then level three of UI is where I'm hoping to get at least a few instances with Jenkins in which the UI change is significant enough that it actually brings new functionality. There's something that you couldn't do with Jenkins before, um, but, but now you can. So uh, and part of the reason why I'm going to go into some detail clicking around on things in here uh, is that this is, well, this is actually the second, this will be the second time that a larger group has seen this. I'm hoping you guys can help me keep score a little bit as to whether or not I'm ever getting to any of these level three UI enhancements. Um, and so the, uh, I want to solicit feedback. 
right? So the thing about Jenkins is it's really community first and community driven. So uh, um, uh, I'm eager to get input from you all about what I've done that's good and what I've done that sucks. Because there's gonna be both for sure. Um, in 20 years of doing this, what I've mostly learned is I'm usually wrong the first time. But I'm able to be close enough to write that I can stand next to it and invite criticism um, and not go away crying like a like little baby. Um, so, uh, um, so with that, let's, let's get into this. So this is a, uh, the first welcome page. And this is, again, this is clearly just a level one sort of change. But the reason why I think it's important enough to start with is to some degree this is, I'm presenting this as a possible out of the box first experience with Jenkins. Today when you open up Jenkins, it's a little bit of a mess. And while there's no functional loss there, um, there's a way in which I'm much happier when I'm looking at a Ferrari than when I'm looking at a, you know, a Peugeot. And I know there's nice Peugeots, but I'd still rather look at a Ferrari. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, so a level one change here. We just take this and start making it look nice. Okay, so uh, I'll dive in and create my first item. Okay, where's my page up? Yep, yep. <laughs> I still don't know what you did. Uh, there we go. Okay, so I am going to bump into bugs here and there. Um, and to some degree, well, I, I want to say it's on purpose. Obviously, it's not. If I had the time and did this all perfectly and we're already done, that would be much better than having bugs. Um, but I want you to have an, a sort of honest understanding of sort of where this semi vaporware, semi alpha thing kind of is. So you'll, you'll sort of know what's going on. Okay, so here's the create item page. If you're familiar with this today in Jenkins, um, this is sort of what I'll call a toilet paper list. Um, you know, it just scrolls on and on with no real breakup of, of what these items are. And if you've got a lot of plugins, this list can get really quite long. Um, so the first thing that I want to do, because we want to encourage lots of plugins, and we might, you might want to have all a zillion different item types. We wouldn't want to put an arbitrary cap on that. You need some way to not have that just become you know, a, a giant toilet paper list. Um, so I'm suggesting that we put in some categories and we group these guys into categories. And to get back the functionality of showing a description, we can have hover behaviors on them to put those descriptions back. Now again, the specifics of what these categories are called, the exact nature of their layout, um, you know, that's something that I'm, that I'm gonna want feedback for. But the idea of having categories for your plugins I think is important. And that ends up carrying over not just here in the create phase, um, but also when you go to manage your plugins, right, one of the common problems with managing your plugins is that uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a mess, right? You get that plugin list, it's, it's also just a straight linear list. There's no grouping, no dimensionality to it. There's no means of sorting or getting evaluation on it. So taking the same notion of adding category metadata to your plugins both helps uh, the creation process and would help your general plugin findability as well. So let's create a new freestyle. All right. So this is the first um, or the most significant aesthetic change um, that I'm going to put forward in this demo. Um, and I like to think this is fairly firmly a level two change. Um, so what I've done here is I've called out blocks here very clearly in the current Jenkins UI. Um, if I can do a freestyle project. It's very ambiguous where one section ends and one doesn't. And a lot of that is just display, right? So I get this list here, and it just looks like white blob everywhere I go, whereas here, um, my sections are fairly obvious. And where this starts to, to cross out of just aesthetic difference and, and start touching into more of a level two kind of change is that because these sections are collapsible, um, you could conceivably integrate uh, documentation, um, plugins, scripts, um, things for your manager uh, so that they understand their way of navigating around Jenkins uh, to, to close these guys with some sort of hash configuration. I haven't actually baked this in yet, but you can imagine that I could have something that is just pound. Ah, okay, anyway, some sort of hashtag showing what sections I want open. You can integrate that right into your email or into your documentation, and it's going to only open the sections of the configuration file that are pertinent to your plugin or whatever your workflow is. 
So that's sort of a level two possible addition coming off of a UI change like this. A level three might be, well, you could actually wrap user security into this, right? So you may have uh, a set of users who all have to use the freestyle job configuration, but you might not want the, your line of business user to be able to add a build step, right? You might want the line of business user to be able to um, publish some little widget that says whose fault it was when the build worked. Um, so uh, you could take a mechanism like this where you're able to expand and collapse sections of the main config and tie it to, uh, uh, to a user role, um, and then you even start getting into a little bit of level three sort of UI functionality. Okay, so um, just to show you exactly the way in which I'm lying, I'm gonna save this guy and it's gonna break. Um, uh, but it did in fact uh, make the job. So, um, so this guy is tied to Jenkins. Um, when you save an item, it does actually save the item. There's two-way communication with an actual Jenkins engine. Um, uh, you may have noticed uh, through this step that some of the stuff that is usually here on the left isn't. Instead, I've got uh, a set of colored buttons, right? So um, uh, this, again, is, is mostly uh, an aesthetic, but somewhat of a level two sort of usability enhancement. So for myself, when I navigate through, through Jenkins, um, there's sort of two kinds of things going on here in the left side. There's a set of contextual changes that happen as I navigate folders and builds, right? These guys, these are actions that are determined by, specifically by what's in this main page. And then I've got build histories here, which actually end up also being contextually determined, but often that's really annoying. So I, I found in my own use, you know, when I click around, I'm watching an upstream build and I just clicked into this other project, and now I can no longer see that upstream build because it's no longer in the context of what I was looking at. Well, ideally, there should be some set of things in Jenkins that are in a global context, right, that are not determined by where you navigate or what you're looking at. So I'm suggesting for argument's sake that those things, like your build queue, might be here on the left. And then to make up for that, right, so there were still things on the other side, um, I'm suggesting we move things that are of local context over to the right. So you have sort of clear left-right progression um, for what's in global context, what's the main item that you're looking at, and what's the local context to that item that you're looking at. So I know that there's a certain degree of UI bad there in what I've done, right? I've taken a set of navigation items that you guys knew where were, and now for argument's sake, I've gone and moved it to the other side of the page. Um, but I wanted to have said, you know, that's sort of the justification. And I want to put out things that are potentially a mistake as early as possible so you guys can say, damn it, Gus, I can't find the damn action that I always used to click over on the left side. Put it back. Um, so I'm expecting that there's a definite possibility that that will be the case. Um, and the sooner, um, the sooner I'm aware of the damage that I'm doing, the better off we all are. Um, okay, so um, let's build this guy a couple of times. So again, you know exactly my level of line. I'll build them three times, and then we can go and look at them. So again, I've done a little bit of page layout manipulation, right? So this guy used to be on, on the right, but now I have this global context that's always on the left, so now I've swapped him over to the right, um, and he's more integrated into the build page to show that he is part of this item that you're looking at. He's not accidentally related. He's, these guys, these build items, are children of this, this project. Um, uh, unlike, you know, as I showed before, potentially managing your Jenkins instance. So I don't wanna make it such that you have to navigate back and forth, um, you know, up and down the hierarchy tree to go and decide that you need a plugin for this particular build. Um, so again, I, I consider this to be somewhat of a level two kind of usability option. Now, if I need to go manage a plugin from here, I can do it, I could do it directly from that thing if I hadn't hard coded my, uh, hyperlinks to the wrong laptop. Anyway, so there's, there's a little more bits of truth and fiction in the vaporware that I'm showing you. Um, so uh, I've also tried to make things collapsible so that uh, for a variety of the size displays, um, you'll get an appealing experience, um, potentially including devices. Um, we haven't gotten all the way through there to the kind of polish that's necessary to really make it sing in a, a phone or device. Um, but again, from my own experience, um, I would like to be able to leave for lunch and uh, still be able to track that damn build so I'll know if I'm in trouble and I gotta hurry up and get back because I broke something, or I can you know, have a beer over lunch, which I've been known to do. Um, uh, so again, these pieces are all designed to pack down for possible varying the so sizes of display. Um, so most of that there is sort of a, a, a 
level one, level two kind of, of UI enhancements. Um, fairly lightweight. Uh, if you're paying close attention, you may have noticed that I have links up here on top um, that I haven't talked about that are somewhat foreign to Jenkins. And so this is a, a, a little bit more controversial and uh, quite a bit less baked. Um, so I'm actually going to switch browsers here um, to show you what I'm thinking about related to that. Smack it through. Here's this yep. going to maximize it? Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, in Jenkins today, by and large, your primary mechanism for navigating and grouping items is folders. Right? If you uh, have a bunch of things that you want to be related, you dump them into a folder. And that's great. The folder can be an arbitrary name. You call it whatever you want. You put as many things as you want in it. You put whatever diversity of things in it. Um, and boom, you go. I, I'm assuming that most of you use folders. Is that, is that true? I know that's not, that's not necessarily true. But, but folders is a great organizational mechanism. Um, true now. It's been true you know, since the caveman from the early drawings. Um, uh, but for some set of things, folders are completely inadequate. Um, so if you have, say, a set of user contexts based on what teams you're in, so you have a QA team, maybe you have a product team, you've got a management team, you've got an engineering team, they may have uh, security concerns that would make you want to create folders for each one of those teams. But then some of those teams may also collaborate on a particular project, right? The Get Our Website Built Super App project. Right? They include all of those teams. So then you have to choose, when I put that build configuration somewhere, I've got to put it in one of those folders. Right? It, can't be, it can't simultaneously exist in two different folders. So you have a sort of fundamental organizational shortcoming of folders. Um, and on top of that, not everything in Jenkins, in the Jenkins universe, makes sense to be thought of as a build configuration. Right? So there's a whole set of things, Docker containers, um, you know, your masters and your slaves, uh, that just aren't quite the same sort of thing as a job configuration. So you might want to classify them completely separately. So, so what I've done here is a first take. Uh, we have a feature coming together called Docker Traceability. Right? And this is a wholly other type of entity. So it makes sense to be a sort of guinea pig candidate. Um, so what I've done is just laid this into a grid. And grid's pretty standard for Jenkins. Um, uh, but rather than having this be grouped by any particular folder, I just have these all together. They're all pooled together. Um, but they can be grouped by arbitrary attributes of these objects. So I can say, show me these guys, for example, grouped by the base image. Um, and then there's other images, you know, little fancy stuff. I like to show a lot of fancy stuff when I can. Um, but then because we have both grouping and sorting, I can get a, basically do a two-dimensional query on this data set. So I can search by since or by state. Um, and then I can, whoops. Not overclick. Um, group by base image name. Okay. Hey. Click the right thing. Click the right thing. So, so I can very quickly filter in and drill in on exactly what I care about, right? And I can do that in a multi-dimensional way. So effectively, I have a visual widget for writing a custom query against this particular kind of object. I don't mean to claim that uh, two-dimensional grids are something that I'm inventing or uh, uh, are, are incredibly novel, but just by adding this little element of UI widgetry, um, you suddenly get what I think is a level-free sort of UI. You suddenly have an easy way to manufacture something that is both a report and an interactive display. And again, if you tie to some of these projects some notion of uh, uh, user-allowed-to-do-ness to the projects, um, you have an opportunity to get even more focused on exactly what the right sort of stuff in your grid is, exactly what the hierarchy is, how they're arranged, who's on top. Okay. So, uh, so that's it. That's uh, um, uh, the kinds of issues that, I, that I'm looking at that I'm trying to put together to get into the next generation Jenkins UI. Like I said, I'm eager to get uh, criticism as, as much as anything. Um, uh, when I first came here to London what, a couple months ago, I gave everybody my mom's phone number. Um, I'm not going to do that again, I'm sorry. She's a very nice lady, but um, so uh, any questions, I'm, I'm eager to take them. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested to know how you see the job configuration stuff fitting in with the job DSL plugin in particular. So do you see this as being a full-up alternative to using the DSL plugin 
or a way of creating a job in the first place, and exporting, or just what the general story is? That so I don't really know anything about the job DSL plugin. Okay. Um, so that's cool. There's configuration pages in general in Jenkins, well, uh, my understanding of it anyway. Like, so if you, if you go to the global configuration, it's the same basic mechanism that pulls together and, and draws the page for you. Yeah. So like what Gus is talking about there is, is basically addressing that type of configuration. So whether it's the job configuration where you've got a big laundry list of stuff, or it's the global configuration for the Jenkins instance itself. I mean, so you've got, you've got a number of places in Jenkins where you've got configuration pages like that. And solving that problem where the semantic layout is basically of no help to you to, to, to make a layout like what, what um, Ghost created there. Um, so I think it's, I'm not totally familiar with the job DSL thing either. Both of us are kind of new to Jenkins in that way, but um, uh, I'm not sure how it, how it relates to it. If it, ha if it, if it uses mechanisms, if it's, it's the same mechanisms that these use, then it's relevant. If it doesn't, it's not relevant, I guess. So the, uh, that can take it off yeah, I guess just to, to complete that thought, and this is also related to anybody building plugins. So if you if you built any plugins, you know that there's a set of form controls that sort of come in Jenkins, and if you're using the Jelly mechanisms, um, uh, they're they're there. They're like the hetero list, the radio list, um, you know, a bunch of different things that can kind of quickly drop controls on. So what I've done here to make this happen is go in there and start manipulating those somewhat and, and adding to them. So uh, um, my hope would be that we come up with a sort of next generation set of widget library items, so you'd have better GUI controls for your plugins as well. So uh, um, so regardless of whatever config you needed, if you were using the Jenkins config mechanism, um, you'd have richer UI widgets to play with, um, and it would inherit. So this is the Maven job type. If that answers your question, at all. so any job type will inherit these these elements. Any thoughts on how you would um, deal with the advanced options? Because that's for us on the same screen pages. You have to get every single advanced option to see if that's what happens. To see what's there. Well, I mean, I, so I haven't gone through every single plugin, obviously. I've really mostly been looking at, um, uh, at the freestyle job. And in particular, there's a couple that I've, you know, subsections of it that I've looked at in, in more detail, like build steps. One of the, the facts of the advanced button today that I find incredibly annoying is the button itself disappears once you click it. Um, so uh, my hope is that just by getting the categorization there and the ability to open and close them uh, working in a sort of more standard fashion, that that will help to some degree. Um, what I think is also necessary is for these, these accordion mechanisms, um, I need to but have not yet surfaced a mechanism so that you can specify via the URL which sections you want open. But then to some degree, it's gonna be the responsibility of an individual plugin author. If they decide they wanna use an advanced button and hide everything, and then that becomes annoying, you gotta click on the advanced button. You know, I don't wanna dictate that. I just wanna make the advanced button that's available to plugin authors as, as convenient and sensible as it can be. If that makes sense. Yes, in the back. Your uh, grouping and filtering view um, on the third tab. Is it possible to have URLs for that view? So you, once you've grouped and filtered, you can share it with someone else. Yeah. So again, that's, that's exactly my, my my hope. I haven't done that homework yet, but that's exactly what I want to do. And that's what would change this, I think, from a, a, a level one sort of UI feature to a level two plus ish UI feature is to have the ability. To, to specify by, by a URL. So then in like your documentation or just when you're sending an email, you can direct people right to the section that they want. And then again, the level three UI add-on to that would be as if permissions were also tied to that mechanism so that you could exclude various pieces of the configuration UI from specific user types. So just to show some of these more fancy guys. Um, so another one of the, the issues with this is that as these guys get nested, um, today, it's really kind of confusing to know who's the child of what. So um, one of my first tasks was to kind of find a way in which we could have n number of nested modules, but you'd still be able to tell you know, who was the child of what. Rather that's, that, that's down to the semantic layer of the, of the thing. There's no real way, if you look at the content for that and you go through it, 
there's, there's no real logical way of actually figuring out where something starts and ends. Like it's kind of, it's everything's just a hodgepodge of stuff. Like if you're an HTML wonk, which I sort of am, um, it's all packed into one table. And so it's all TR, 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 TR. Uh, no, so another question? Uh, what is the time scale for the new UI? Um, so, well, we're still working that out. <laughs> but, uh, um, oh, uh, yeah, but I, I'm eager to have as many resources committed to it as possible, as fast as possible. So uh, um, it's, it really, it makes the little child in my heart sing to see this room fairly full. So, uh, um, so I'd like it to happen, you know, as soon as I can make it happen, and as soon as, as soon as it can happen. Um, the only thing I can really promise at the moment is that uh, um, I am currently uh, uh, sort of talking about this stuff on the uh, Jenkins CI developer group, the mm -hmm. Google group. If any of you are familiar with that, if you're not, I can give you the address. You know, I'll be over in the booth after this, um, and I'm looking at setting up a blog page as well as a spot where I'm going to start showing, you know, either concept wireframes or, where possible, actual sort of clip clickable demos. Because, like I said, what I'm really eager to do is to get feedback as early as possible, generate a certain degree of buzz, obviously, um, and, um, and sort of start it rolling in a kind of grassroots way. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess the follow-up question is how can I help, like as a community member, how can I, you know, help make this happen? So, uh, yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, um, thank you for being a member of the community. <laughs> so thank you, Brian, my boss. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so step one is going to be for, uh, for me to get a blog up um, so that uh, so you guys can, can look over my shoulder and, and poke me. And the first kind of things that I'm going to be wanting is just sort of verbal feedback. This seems right. This doesn't seem right. This is maybe going to break my plug-in. I'm really worried about that. Um, at some point, we'll have, have binaries to actually download and potentially real pull requests um, out to the community. At that point, what I'll definitely want is for people to, to look at the code and yell at me about what a crappy coder I am. Um, I'll want people to uh, 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 try it with their plugin, yell at me because it broke their plugin, um, uh, and and start seeing how things work. I'm not at that stage yet. This is still mostly vaporware. But again, I wanted to get it in front of people as soon as possible to sort of open the communication channel. Uh, you know, if I waited until everything was done, then it would be wrong. And, and again, my inner child would. Come. Yeah. Um, just give some feedback. Um, two points. Um, first, it's a per user theme configuration. Um, if we have like multiple Jenkins masters uh, running, and uh, I need to log in, I have several several uh, masters can log in. I want to synchronize my themes between these um, masters, and there should be a easier way. I, I do not need to manually configure every master. Logging in the configure faster, like a copy or some easy way to do that. And uh, yeah, the second point is uh, when the new UI is available, I suggest um, still keep the old style uh, UI available because we do not want to like uh, make a big change to all the developers and they cannot find the the old buttons. We need somehow a soft change that they can gradually. Um, switch to the new UI. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the reasons why theming is so important to me. Um, it's because that gives us a, a back door so that if you don't like what I've done, you don't, you're, not, you're not forced into it. Um, yeah. So your first, well, actually, I'll go backwards on your, uh, the last point is something we've been talking about internally already and we've been discussing that. And, uh, the idea of kind of introducing perspectives into, into Jenkins. So, that um, basically you can still, we can still maintain the old Jenkins open field, that's your kind of advanced um, perspective, but allow people to create, like if you're a DevOps, to kind of have a DevOps style um, uh, focused UI that, I mean, that you can select. If you're familiar with Eclipse and some other of these tools, that they, they call it that kind of thing, or views and whatever, but to allow different types of views in, um, on top of Jenkins, and there's all, like there's, there's um, market, Support for that idea out there in the in the sense that lots of people have have gone and created their u their own UIs on top of Jenkins. So it would be nice to actually formalise that in some way within Jenkins and allow people to do it within the Jenkins framework and 
Um, so have a single drink in Simpsons with different perspectives on it, and depending on what your role is within the organisation. Um, your first question I didn't quite get themes you said or something, was it? Or? Oh, themes. Themes. Yeah, sharing them across, uh, like in JSC yeah. or multiple masters. Um, I don't know how that's done at the moment. I know there is a, a, a like within Jenkins Operations Center, which is a Cloudy's product. Um, there is the idea of like a promoter shared configurations and stuff like that, and basically synchronizing configurations across different masters and stuff. And that would be one way of doing it, I guess. But um, I, I guess it's something we just have to one step at a time. Yeah. Um, so just one last thing I wanted to talk about before we really quick put out uh, another minute is the idea of uh, JavaScript modules. So yeah. Um, And like this plays into what Gus is talking about there with the data grid and stuff like that. Like that at the moment, things like that are not really possible. It's not just down to CSS modularization, so we got but the way that JavaScript is done with the Jenkins core at the moment is a bit of a, um, not so good, not so good anyway. But um, we've got we've got a litany of different problems, uh, mostly around mostly basically going down to the fact that we don't really have any established patterns for how to develop. Uh, client-side UIs within Jenkins, like in terms of building modular JavaScript uh, applications and assembling them and stuff like that. So one of the things that we've um, been experimenting with within CloudBees uh, in a number of places is the idea of using node-based modules. So basically allowing you to create proper JavaScript, node-style JavaScript applications. And then, um, they like, say, so you could use Require.js or something like that on the client side then to, to load that up. But uh, the, the approach we've been taking is to use a thing called Browserify. I'm not sure if people are familiar with it or not. But basically, what it allows you to do is take an, kind of a node style application with lots of modules in it and bundle them into a single bundle that can be loaded in the browser in one go. And then within your app, you, just, you, you can use not standard Require type um, semantics in, in, for actually loading the different modules. And uh, we found it very nice, and it um, allows you to do lots of other things as well within, uh, like temp templating and stuff like that. Um, so how we package it up then is use a thing called Gulp, which is uh, similar to uh, other JavaScript node-based um, application assembly type programs. Uh, Gulp is another one, or Gulp, sorry, Grunt is another one. Uh, and then to hook it into our plugins in terms of build, a build time, we use a, a, another plugin called uh, the Frontend Maven plugin, which basically allows you to run um, Node applications in your from your um, Maven build. So, like in the generate source step or whatever, we're able to say assemble my Node app now and put it into a bundle that I can load then using an adjunct or whatever mechanism you want in your browser. So that's just something we've been playing around with in terms of modularis modularization, and there's some other ongoing debates, debates between myself and KK about. How, how, how to move that modularization idea forward again, and um, just thought it throw it out there for. So, if there's any other questions, that's the end of this. If there's any other questions? Yep. One question about the uh, module, but um, about, uh, do you have any uh, plans to improve the customization of the job list? Uh, we have talked something about that today. Of the which list? The, the job list in uh, in Jenkins. The job list. Yeah. Yeah. The job list. Yeah. Um, the job list, I guess, on the index yeah, yeah. 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 So, so the same stuff I was showing with. Uh, so he was asking about the main job list on the main page. So, so I showed a, a bit of a fancier grid, uh, specifically with containers, um, because that's sort of a new feature coming out. But my hope would be we'd apply the same logic to to jobs as well. So you ought to be able to browse jobs by folders, but you shouldn't have to browse jobs by folders. You should be able to sort and group jobs by arbitrary properties that you care about. Um, so, uh, so my hope is that same notion of multi-dimensional grids and queries can still apply. Apparently, I'm getting that. Yeah. yeah, we'll take. Yeah, we're running a little over. So, if you have any questions, um, they'll be available, right? Yeah, we're yeah, gonna we're go to the these experts booth, I guess, and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. we'll be amateurs at the. <laughs> <laughs>